words. 50 single space pages. 13,804 words. 4 great dragons. Guns. Cars. Terrorists. Explosions. Motherfucking dervish. This is Shadow Run Story Time 20. Gonna dive right into this one because it's a doozy. As with the last one, please to choose epic climax music of your choice. Although my suggestion always remains the inimitable prodigy, I'm a fan of thunder. I'm going to be dumping my pixel art folder to keep the look consistent. Most of it is from a Tumblr user named Nwarlak if you want to check it out. Ahem. 8.45pm. The 23rd of February, 2074. The junction of the 5 and 405 freeways. Portland to Black Eureka West Wine 3K convertible sprinted across Markham Bridge. Its tailpipe sputtering blue flames in gunshot gusps as it caught up to the VIP. The VIP's vehicle nominally resembled a garbage truck. Although most of the machinery was non-functional and the surface grime was artificial. Most of the trash compactor had been excised to make room for a turbocharger and expanded engine. Which certainly explained why the Eureka's driver had to even put any effort at all into keeping up with the otherwise cumbersome vehicle. Behind the unassuming little convoy, a large orange dragon and a smaller white dragon circled downtown Portland, diving between buildings and periodically passing out of sight. A black cloud billowed out of the shattered roof of the Portland Museum of Science and Industry, underlit with a flickering yellow-orange glow from the gunfire and open flames below and standing in stark contrast to the ubiquitous sprawl permadisk. A terrorist attack. Please stay inside and evacuate downtown Portland if at all possible. Do not call emergency lines at this time unless you have a medical crisis. Response teams are forthcoming. Miss Reagan, the West Wines driver, clicked the radio off. She was an unconventionally attractive woman with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a jawline that, whilst normally out of place, could be accurately described as handsome on her muscular frame. She wore a skirt suit primarily composed of a prototype armor weave that could stop large caliber rifle fire but, much more importantly, had the texture of fine Italian silk. Of course, Miss Reagan was a sharper shifting adept, as was her partner in the shotgun seat, Mr. Monroe, so it made the matter of appearances somewhat irrelevant. Monroe adjusted his thick black sunglasses and leaned over the back of his seat, scanning the freeway behind them. Most traffic had cleared out due to the large flashing emergency sign superimposed over the freeway, which made spotting hostiles all the simpler. Grey SUV. Mile back and closing, commented Monroe, reaching between his legs for a black briefcase which swiftly unfolded into a ceramic high-power SMG frame. The gun let out a tinny whirr as the smart link booted up. Think it's the G's Reagan pulled the sports car back from the VIP truck. Her knuckles tightening on the wheel in case she needed to go into manual. Fits the bill, said Reagan, loading a magazine of apps rounds. Just be happy it isn't the Aztecs or the runners. No sense of restraint, agreed Reagan, gesturing with her hand to the truck ahead of them. Mr. Hepburn, your services are required, acknowledged, commented a voice over Reagan and Monroe's tack nut, as a figure in green fatigues popped up from the back of the truck followed by the long thin line of an anti-material rifle as it was braced along the top of the truck. GS are driving evasively. They're onto us. Just get a clean hit, griped Monroe, tapping the side of his gun absently. Since the VIP's driving, we don't want to put any more risk on you than necessary, as Hepburn slowly lined up his shot on the SUV, which had accelerated into the 100 range and would close within a few seconds. A massive tilt at a gunship done up in garish red, white and blue buzzed over the freeway overpass at dangerously low altitude, sending detritus flying and setting off a few car alarms on the streets below. What was that Raz is making for the ground zero clusterfuck? Yelled Reagan. Focus. Hepburn Reagan and Monroe ducked as the west wind's windshield shattered and the trunk rattled violently. A grey clad mercenary was leaning out of the SUV's passenger side as it veered to the left. His battle rifle roaring, G's in heavy armor, barked Monroe. Get the engine block the sound of the battle rifle was briefly overshadowed by the cacophonous bang of the anti-material gun as it planted a single fist sized hole on the left side of the SUV's hood. The SUV's machinery screeched in anguish, but the large vehicle kept gaining. 
No good keep firing Hepburn cocked the rifle and planted another hole through the windshield. Blood and bits of meat and metal spattered out the rear window. But the pursuit continued. Got one of the rear gunners. Cover me screw this. Growled Reagan. When we get back. Hepburn. You're getting a citation. Monroe. You know what to do. Monroe grunted an affirmation. Tugged gingerly on his gyro mount. Sighted the general area of the front of the SUV. And let the SMG rip. The gunner was the first to go, flopping limply back into the SUV with what remained of the adjacent car door, trailing thin red lines. The driver pulled forward to avoid getting struck, only exposing the one remaining man in the rear of the SUV, who fumbled to load a rocket-propelled grenade before taking three rounds to the head, shattering his helmet faceplate. He pitched forward and out of the SUV, his heavy combat armor doing little to stop him from becoming a stain on the road. Hepburn Ray sighted the driver of the SUV, although he was stalled by a feeling of intense heat just behind him. He spun to face a large fiery serpent, manifested in the vestigial garbage reservoir with him. As TX, yelled Hepburn, before his feet abruptly cut out as a geyser of fire washed out of the top of the truck. Fuck Monroe pulled a micro grenade launcher and planted a shot into the wheel well of the battered SUV, finally causing it to flip dramatically and careen into the divider, its ragdoll occupant spin wheeling onto the road. He loaded a new mag of apps into the SMG and scanned for hostiles. It's not the Aztecs, it's the runners, groaned Reagan, peering in the rearview mirror. A silver Hyundai family sedan was flying up the 405 at unbelievable speed, leaving visible red hot tracks. They're pulling something with spirits. We are no longer playing nice. Reagan, growled Monroe, reaching behind his seat to retrieve a disposable fire and forget missile launcher. He smiled as it linked with his glasses, targeting the oncoming car. Reagan gasped. Holy fuck Monroe spun in time to see the cars disappear, revealing the real sedan, keeping pace directly in front of their own vehicle while driving in reverse, pinning the two cars bumper to bumper. The familiar silhouette of Aztecnology power armor glinted from the space above the sunroof, as well as the click clack of an LMG bipod settling into place. Time slowed down for Monroe as he tried to bring the missile launcher up to bear. His ears rang and then dulled as he watched the hood of his car deform and shred apart like tissue paper, the few remaining fragments of windshield likewise giving way and turning into a burst of razor snowflakes. Reagan shuddered, her hands gripping and then relaxing off the steering wheel as her gut sprinkled into the back of the car, taking a short cut through the sundered vinyl that had been her seat. Monroe briefly achieved missile lock, until a wheezing thud signaled that gravity no longer applied and the world turned into a spiral of color as black rubber sinews snapped and catapulted off into the sky. He obtained balance as a shooting star erupted from his shoulder and made for somewhere in the financial district. He was halfway through making peace with God when his entire universe became pavement. 8 p.m. The 25th of January, 2074, Kells Irish Restaurant and Pub, Portland. Titanga why didn't you tell us you knew each other Belfast the bank robber and Jordan Formic the super spy sat at one end of the table with a lithe, hardened elf woman in a leather jacket, facing wildcard, dervish, Ben, and Locke. All involved parties were freely partaking of libations, and wildcard and Belfast had already been pre-gaming, although no one trusted the food aside from dervish. Who had gone with the rationale of how hard is it to fuck up a steak dervish grunted in dismay at his tofu steak as Belfast, an elf with the same sort of too many plastic surgeries John Doe vibe as wildcard, down the last of his Guinness. His voice was a high pitched Irish brogue, in contrast to his former partner's baritone Scottish. M sisters a smuggler fare the ancients all up and down the west coast, said Belfast, gesturing to Kara, who briefly looked up from pulling her long. Blonde hair into a ponytail to wordlessly acknowledge that she had been mentioned. Use her whenever I need to get weapons into the nano cal free. Formic looked at his watch but smiled dimly. He clearly had somewhere else to be but was waiting for the appropriate etiquette to dismiss himself. Meanwhile, I've taken to using the ancients, Kara in particular, whenever I need to deniably access some, less than legal goods. Locke raised an eyebrow. What's that supposed to mean Formic stirred his martini and allowed his thin smile to crack into a roguish grin. 
let's just say that the raging Novico problem in Seattle's political scene happens to make things easier for certain tier interests. Kara spoke up, at last. Her voice was dry and husky, displaying the harsh life that she had lived in much clearer detail than her comparatively unscarred appearance. So, when Peter and Dylan asked my boss and my brother if they knew a smuggler, Ben gave Formic a good stink eye. You used that name really Formix coughed. Well, I figured as long as you're not using it, Sean, he put extra emphasis on the S, getting a brief chuckle out of Locke, who proceeded to stare into his drink when the stink eye found its way to his doorstep, Dervish, eyeing his empty plate with half resolved intent to lick, instead looked up and asked, we gonna get down to this oh, right, wildcard pulled up on our window and began marking spots on a Seattle map. Managed to bring most of our guns through customs on an intelligence thing, but still got a lot of gear Seattle side that needs moving. Milspec armor's big one, but there's also the plastic explosives, thermite, and the explosive and sabal rounds for the guns. A list appeared alongside the map, demarcating where and in what amounts the aforementioned could be found. Jesus, chuckled Kara, nervously. Are you boys gearing up for war? Dervish responded. Deadpan, maybe. Kyra gulped, another problem, mentioned wildcard, if we're going to be smuggling through the ancients, we need insurance that they won't screw us just cause we got a couple of green skins on the team, Belfast waved a dismissive hand, ancients are more a syndicate now a gang, racism's not good for business, sides, why haven looked like an orc since 68 both of us essentially humans at this point, easy for you to say, yeah little squint, counted wildcard, Affectionately, Mr. Essentially Human but lives forever, I can assure you, there will be no double crosses, interrupted Kara. We'd be violating three golden rules of West Coast gang life. Formic seemed intrigued by the novelty of this statement, and made a non-specific, inquisitive noise, prompting Kara to continue. Don't go back on deals, don't mess with another man's stuff, she eyed dervish who was sipping non-threateningly on his whiskey, nervously, and don't fuck with no dervish. Dervish looked up from his drink, nodded approvingly, and then finished the glass. I think that's my cue to leave, said Formic, standing up and slipping his tailored jacket over his slim turtleneck. I'll see you out, said Ben, standing as well. As the two elves stepped outside, Ben whispered, harshly, you're sticking it to her, you corrupt. Horny old bastard that's classified, soldier, responded Formic, lighting up a cigarette and disappearing into the streets. 9am, the 26th of January, 2074, Ancient Chapter House, Lake Oswego, Titanga the frenetic beats of synth trash hadn't dimmed all night, although through the well soundproofed floor they were mostly reduced to vibrations that one could vaguely catch the gist of through one's feet. Dervish sat on his futon in the dim attic room, admiring the four suits of milspec armor against the wall, artfully lit by a single, bare bulb. Ben's was the lightest, a ruthenium coated software number that could be folded up and stuffed in a backpack in a pinch, but which could nevertheless stop a rifle burst, also in a pinch. Wildcard's thick, plated suit had been recently modded. And although the shoulder pads and chest plates still were clearly knight errant swat with the serial numbers filed off, the ceramic, clown-like face mask and the integrated armor com links were all wildcard. Locke's eagle warrior combat gear was burnished but faded, its dramatic flanges worn down by time, combat, and hasty field repairs. And then there was the America Sand Suit, Dervish's magnum opus. A state-of-the-art fighting vehicle that had the audacity to pretend to be a suit of armor. Dervish sighed affectionately, wiped a smear off his sibri, and stood up to rejoin his team, who were outlining the plan over scrambled eggs by the attic's only window. I think this guy's our best bet, repeated Ben, gesturing to a hovering our window that depicted an uncharacteristically plain, male elf with short brown hair, dressed in a frumpy business suit. Dervish yawned. Who nice of you to join us, mate, chuckled Wildcard, switching off the camping stove that he was using to field brew coffee. You know, said Dervish, the elves downstairs probably have a coffee machine, back on topic, please, said Locke, sitting cross-legged in cargo pants and a t-shirt, scraping at a greasy paper plate for survivors, Harry Dexter, import-export guru, reiterated Ben, 
considered by many in the tea business world to be the preeminent man in the know when valuable goods travel in or out of the tea. Has people all over the shipping and insider trading scene, specializes in magical goods and artifacts. Sound familiar sounds like our man, agreed Dervish. So when do we do the hit everyone stared at Dervish blankly. You know, not a hit hit. But when do we scope it out, move to steal the info actually, said Wildcard. Speaking simply, as he would to a child, we were just thinking of setting up an appointment and paying for the info like Business people. Dervish gawked. We can do that Ben grabbed the R window and absently tossed it behind his shoulder. I know it's hard to visualize, D, but there are people who like money just as much, if not more, than we do. 2 p.m. Dexter Imports Advisory Offices, Downtown Portland, Titanga the team strolled through the crisp, clean lobby of the office building. The whole interior was done up in soft coffee colors, a tasteful mocker for desktops and other surfaces, a smoky almond for the walls, and an understated cream tone for the floor. The team's leather loafers clacked against the vanilla tiles, with the exception of Dervish's raptor legs, which made shrill ting 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 noises as they adjusted to carry his prodigious weight across the room. I'm getting weird vibes, growled Dervish, under his breath, as he eyed a bored looking elven rent a cop at the front desk. He adjusted his red, white and blue tire, which fit a little too snugly around his massive linebacker shoulders. The top two buttons of his plain white button-up shirt were undone by necessity, rather than choice. Cult vibes, that's how you are around salarymen in general, dervish, responded Locke, himself in a pink silk shirt with slate slacks, artfully arranged with his three-day stubble and tousled hair to evoke just the right level of calculated neglect to appearance. Just don't get knocked off your donkey and start shooting up the place, wildcard, in his plain grey business suit. Gave Locke the best expression of confusion he could manage with his mostly plastic face. It's an Aslina phrase, noted Locke, with a shrug. I guess it doesn't really translate, nah, not really, agreed Bend, peering over the sunglasses of his black G-man ensemble, pressing the up button on the elevator. We doing this after a brief, non-lethal exposure to a Muzak cover of Christy Dee's Dancing with the Fireflies. The elevator doors dinged, and the team exited into a cubicle farm that echoed the quiet cacophony of business. Phones ringed and were answered non-stop, as desk jockeys offered clients advice on both local and abroad investments. Disembodied conversations about an aura chalcum low discovered in Nepal and an exhibit of magical artifacts being featured at the Bellagio in Vegas intermixed with the wine of an active microwave in the kitchen and the politely understated cheers of two men on break watching the local combat biker semi-finals in the lunchroom. An elf of indiscriminate ethnicity with an athletic build, tanned skin, high cheekbones, and bow-shaped lips whistled the tune of Maria Mercurial's Take It to Mr., making his way towards the team. As he approached, Locke stepped forward to intercept him. The young businessman almost bumped into him, but adjusted at the last moment and grinned a saccharine smile. Hey, you guys are at Dexter's 2.30, right yes, and you are Locke put his hand forward to shake, but the elf stepped back and held his hands up disarmingly, revealing that he was missing the ring finger on his left hand, and it had been replaced with a plastic prosthetic. Not important enough for this MR. Dexter made very clear that I should escort you directly to his office. Locke shrugged, and followed the young man, who immediately pursed his lips and resumed his tune as he marched forward into the office. Fair enough, the employee was getting awkwardly into the last few notes of the song, whistling over the volume of anything else in the office and doing little dance moves, when he stopped at a black box of polarized glass at the back of the office. Dexter is right through here. He's expecting you, yeah, thanks, where's my tip kidding the elf laughed at his own joke and shimmied past, dropping the previous song and launching into an equally shrill rendition of one of the recently released just rediscovered jet black tracks. Dervish cringed and stretched his knuckles around his cybers purports. The plain, brown haired elf with the bad sense for suit sizing appeared at a previously unseen door in the polarized queue, peering out suspiciously. Sorry about that. He and all the other temps are new hires, news of fresh money on the wind and, buzz buzz buzz, I find myself in need of a few more drones. Harry Dexter, Vincent Darcelva, said Locke, 
reaching his hand out to shake and smiling when his offer was answered this time around. Dexter I Dervish, Ben, and Wildcard, step into my office, Dar Silver and, Associates Ben snocked, you could say we've been through hell together. The team settled into seats around Dexter's real wood desk, looking out upon the office. The glass was a muted tint from the inside, enough to survey the rest of the office without being distracted by it. Dexter tapped a button on the underside of the desk, and a white noise machine began broadcasting. I looked into the topic that we discussed on the phone, Dar Selva, yes, and you asked if I knew of any shipment of a major artifact into or out of the tip. I'm afraid that I don't have anything matching that description. Lock scowled, crossing his right leg over his left and leaning back in his chair as Dexter settled in at his desk. Then why call us in? If you already knew because I have some information that might point you in the right direction, said Dexter, coolly, and I'm willing to waive the fee entirely if you're willing to help me help you, with all due respect, please cut the jargon, said Locke, sternly, word is that a local talismanger, Alexander Gomez, has received a startlingly large commission from outside sources for a variety of strictly need to know spell formulae, he refuses to accept my price for the information, which is unfortunate, because it is, in fact, my business to know these things to keep my consultancy running, and it also led me to believe that he may be dealing with shady clientele, and in the TI festival season, the audacity, leered Ben, exactly. So, I figure whatever this is, has to do with what you boys are after, and given your unique trade, Dexter leaned his elbows on the table and Locke nodded sagely in response. Yes. I think we can look in Gomez for you, provided you tell us what you know afterwards. Dexter's fingers intertwined beneath his calculating smile. We have an arrangement, then. I'll have my secretary provide an address. As the party stepped out of the building into the parking lot, Wildcard clicked his keys. The black sedan chirped agreeably. This seems pretty cut and dry. Not so, said Ben, gravely. Dervish stopped a few feet away from the car. Surveying Ben apprehensively. Oh you guys go handle the thing with the talismonger. You'll need lock there for the magic stuff. Anyhow, wildcard sat on the trunk, causing the car to bow slightly. And you will be doing I'm gonna shadow that whistling kid. What? Asked lock. The annoying temp yeah. Said Ben. Dervish. Do you remember that feeling you got? Dervish nodded as Ben held up a hand and put his comlink to his ear. The team just got his side of the conversation. Yeah. Un. Specific employee. Security director McWilliams. Yeah, him. Uh, it's Sean Falstaff calling for him. Yeah. From the Christmas party. He knows me. There was a pause. The whole team looked between each other. No one except Ben had any idea what was going on. Evidently. Hey, Twody. Look. Can you do a little favor for me? Wait. Hold on. Is this line secured? Ben held the comlink away from his ear as a tirade of nasal tone cursing screeched out of the receiver. Yeah, okay. Security director. Ask a stupid question. I get it. Look, does your brain have, like, photo archives you know, like a family photo album folder on the desktop or whatever? Okay, I get that. Semantics. I get it. Look. Do you still have the material from that whole goat fuck with Taka back in 2072 the comlink screeched again. I know, I know, we had that whole never speak that name again thing going, but I figured you wouldn't still be mad after. Okay, you do great, could I get a copy of that the comlink ceased screeching and made an obliging ding noise. Whoa, um, prompt, thanks, I, no, Emily and I don't have time to watch your kids next week. We're on the job, Twody. I don't care if you have tickets. We're in Portland. No, I can't. Dervish squinted, trying to catch whatever it was that he was missing about that whole goat fuck with Taka back in 2072. No, our job isn't to fuck with your nuclear robot that's about to be unveiled here. Would you believe it has nothing to do with Razitz? Okay, bye. If it turns out my hunch isn't correct, Ben said. Settling down onto the trunk of the car with the rest of the team, then it'll be a load off my mind. I'll tell you that. Lock and Wildcard didn't know what, exactly, they were looking for, but watched attentively. The camera approached a cheery receptionist sitting at a cheap, synthetic material desk. Behind the desk, 
a terrifyingly immense salish man wearing a business monkey outfit stepped around a potted plant, carrying a pot of coffee. A wiry man with a prominent Glasgow grin leaned over another visible desk, fiddling with a spreadsheet. On one pastel-colored wall was a photo of Mount Kilimanjaro, and on another was a picture of a marathon runner, captioned the only way to lose is not to try, the cameraman said, his voice nasal and unpleasant. I swear to god, one of them just said how's the wife, like, unironically, the effete albino elf in the black business suit held a hand in front of the camera, his voice was soft, but with the slightest traces of a New York accent. Let's just play it cool, ahem, excuse me mom the receptionist looked up and popped her bubble gum, need something, handsome Geppetto stepped forward and leaned on the desk, we're looking for Johnson. This garnered an immediate wince from the receptionist, as a large African American orc with sleeve tattoos passed by, chatting on his comlink about the big merger. Oh nut Johnson's in a meeting. Can I take a message the camera watched from behind Geppetto as he took off his hat and made eye contact with the receptionist. To the left, Dervish leaned against the marathon runner wall display. Well, miss, we really need to talk to him. Say it's from Takamoto, Ben paused the video, as an athletic man of indiscriminate ethnicity with high cheekbones, bow-shaped lips, and a missing ring finger passed by on the way to the water cooler, whistling 2072's latest flash in the pan J-pop tune. Ho ho holy fuck, said Dervish, his sibberies wide and awestruck. Jensen is back, Locke looked expectantly at Dervish. Jensen before you and wild cards time, said Ben pocketing his comlink and opening the rear door of the car to begin retrieving his spy gear. Jensen was a whole bunch of shell companies based around some kind of black ops hardcase merc team that we ran into by coincidence in Neo Tokyo. Dervish nodded in agreement and spoke up. Super pro, from what we saw, settled in and started acting like ordinary office workers. It was crazy, like a Bunraku switch got flipped. We blew their cover and they all made out like ghosts. Well, all except their public face, noted Ben. They detonated his cranial bomb the moment it was clear we were under him. So, said Wildcard, pulling up a series of public access pages on the Jinsen Corporation, cohesive brand synergy for a more diverse future. You boys ran into some kind of super black ops team in the past, they pulled a fast one on you, and now they've resurfaced in a magical imports consultancy as we coincidentally know that a major artifact is coming into town. That's about the long and short of this, yeah, said Dervish, sitting up from the trunk of the car and causing the suspension to jump up by easily 10 inches. So expect things to get real shitty, real fast, well, we should be on the safe side on our end, just shaking down a talismanger, noted Locke, I'm worried about what happens if you get caught, Ben smiled darkly as he pulled his tactical hood over his head. As the goggles settled down over his eyes, they whirred and lit up with Ben's UI, and then darkened to match the ambient light. Locke, you ever read Spy vs. Spy 4pm, Eagle's Eye Talismanger, North Portland, Titangar Alex Gomez, a pudgy Native American elf with a greasy ponytail hairdo, had enjoyed a recent upsurge in profits, coinciding with the beginning of the TIFF festival season, he'd inherited his human father's business a few decades back when all the humans were relegated to second class citizens, didn't give it back during the reintegration, and had never looked back as far as unscrupulous acquisitions went. The spree of recent special orders had tipped him off, somewhere in the dim recesses of what remained of his morals, to the prospect that major shit was about to go down, but it was quickly squashed with the familiar not my problem mantra and buried in the convenient ex post facto excuse of customer confidentiality. And it would have stayed that way, were it not for the aloof Aztec in the silk shirt who was asking too many questions. Look, amigo, said the roguishly handsome, Latino elf standing across the grungy, fetish covered counter, I can really make it worth your while, my employer just has an interest in seeing what kind of arcane hardware his contemporaries are packing, comprend Gomez scowled. In the back of his mind, he resented this interloper. This quizzling of the elves are all attractive stereotype that genetics had unfortunately deemed him not worthy of. Unless your employer wants to buy something, your employer isn't touching the sales records, amigo. Okay, fine, said the asshole, with a practiced smile. 
Do you have any Aztec tradition mind reading spell scrolls in nothing illegal, but enough to get a little edge? Know what I'm saying Gomez either massive orc in the armored jacket who was milling around by a row of Christian iconography. He assessed everyone who entered the shop, and the big guy wasn't even awakened, let alone a Christian theurge. This was looking more and more like runner business, which the special customer had warned Gomez to be wary of. No, I don't have anything like that in, Gomez lied, and I'd advise you and your trained monkey to piss off before I hit the panic button for extortion. How much does a bullet cost the big lug in the back spoke up, having moved to a rack of enchanted weapons. They were a big draw among normies, appealingly forbidden in the same way that a teenager will lust after a state carnival katana. Obviously, most of the weapons on the rack were non-magical, but designed to look appropriately fantastical such that idiots would buy them. What, like a magic bullet the silver ones will run you a few hundred. Na, na, said the orc, shrugging his shoulders informally and stepping towards the counter. Like a normal bullet, Gomez blinked at the strange serenity of the six and a half foot inquisitor. Like, ten nui in that effect the orc nodded sagely, looking around the store in muted wonder. After an awkward silence, he turned to look down at Gomez again. The Aztec stepped away from the counter obligingly. Guess weapons taxes are stricter here. Makes sense. Well armed populace under a monarchy. She eat. That's asking for trouble. The orc Sibirize made a click her noise as he blinked. Only evident because of the silence in the rest of the shop. You know how much a cyberblade costs I don't know. Gomez lied again. A couple thousand na, man, na, laughed the orc, shaking his head. Not when you're dealing with dervish. The name clicked to Gomez as he was picked up bodily by the throat. A sword the length and thickness of a machete jutted forth from the orc's other arm as protective covers slid over his eyes. When you're dealing with dervish, super blades come motherfucking free. Gomez resisted the urge to shit himself. Gasping, he attempted to focus on a power bolt, only to feel it fizzle. His aggressor commented, See, when Dervish is making a sale, ain't nothing gonna come between him and closing the deal. That's why he brought his man Locke. Locke ran magical ops for the Aztecs for decades. Even specializes in counter spilling no shit. Right that's what we and the running biz call convenience. Chuma, feeling the watching eyes of the Aztec, Gomez instead went to his last resort, and pushed the panic button on his comlink resolving to bribe the cops to overlook his more questionable stock. Now, Dervish also don't appreciate outside investors attempting to edge in on these mad once in a lifetime deals, which is why his homie outside took the liberty of jamming all outgoing communications, panic buttons included, while we were scoping out the joint. That way it's just you and Dervish, so you can know that we here at Dervish Industries are taking your case personally, as Dervish slid the blade under Gomez's inseam. The urge to shit himself overpowered his previously staunch resistance. He gurgled and squirmed as his bowels voided. Dervish looked down in muted disbelief. Bitch just chat all over my sword. Lock, just wash it off in the bathroom. I put that shit in my body. Lock, Gomez saw white fog and red spatter as Dervish threw him. One handed, through the door to the back room. His hearing cut in and out, like a television with bad reception. Got to keep it sticking out till I can wash it. Awkward. Gomez wiped the blood from his eyes in time to see a lock crouching over him. All pretense of friendliness absent from his smile. So let's revisit the whole sales records thing. Amigo. 7 p.m. Westmoreland. Titanga Ben's goggles alerted him to a call from Wildcard, which he routed to his Minecraft run receiver. For the last few hours, he's been hanging upside down in a tree, watching. Or rather, listening to the whistler and a few grey jumpsuited compatriots pretend to fix a power line outside of Harry Dexter's townhouse. A van marked Pan X repairs appeared to be their mobile command center, and Bend had caught a glimpse of a lot of guns inside. Hey, wildcard, check that the line is secure. Real quick. I wait for a moment. There was an ominous silence at the other end of the line. Nor, someone was running a sniffer on ye. Not ye specifically, just afraid that someone is following em, and you just let them know that we know, hissed Ben. That lil silence was me tackin' one of your old phone conversations and looping it in so we sound like a couple of civvies. You record our phone conversations not important. Look, we tracked the spells that were being ordered. Ben looked up, 
briefly catching the familiar glint of a fly spy drone before it disappeared again into the night sky. He eyed his quarry, who hadn't acknowledged if they were onto him, but that didn't comfort him. Yeah, their whole bunch of surveillance and mind control spells. Not all of them strictly legal. Control thoughts. Alter memories. Read memories. Nothing good. Bought, go figure, by the Jinsen Corporation, now based out of Seattle. Amazonian shamanic tradition. Figure that's whatever mage they've got on staff up here. Last time we ran into them, they were Londoners in Neo Tokyo, pretending to be from San Fran. Sounds like a new chain link. Anything else yeah. Lot of combat gear sales to types matching runners. 2. Some hermetic destruction spells tied to an account in Germany, a non-standard power focus special order to an account in Cal Free. In other words, there are more runners around. I. Dinny how pro they are. They were far from the only tossers got suckered into this job. That's almost comforting. Almost. What are you up to participating in the great surveillance circle jerk our time? Whistler and his Jinsen buddies are keeping tabs on Dexter, so I'm keeping tabs on them. And I'm pretty certain that someone is trying to find me, although I doubt they've spotted me yet. Bend managed to spot the fly spy again, which was circling a few blocks away. Yeah, I'm catching a drone node apparent in non-hidden. Slave G another node, a comlink. Also flying around, some hundred feet up. You spot a flying mage bent scanned the skies, flicking between filters. Only to blanch at what is ultrasound registered. Not a mage. Whispered Ben. Conspirator really. What's up I'll tell you what's up. Said Ben. Shimmying down from his tree. A 7 foot long lizard with wings. Wearing Rathenium cloak tactical armor and operating a helmet cum link. Drake. Said Wildcard. His voice cold and calculating. Any idea if it's one of SK's I hope so. Hissed Ben. Letting his feet settle on the ground excruciatingly slowly, otherwise it means there's more than two great dragons in on this, has to be maybe, it is a turf, don't suppose you'll be wanting to stick around, no, I don't suppose so, 8am, the 27th of January, 2074, ancient chapter house, Lake Oswego, Titanga in light of existentially and physically terrifying revelations, the team hadn't slept very well, increasingly, Schwarzkopf's request that bloodshed be minimized on this job as looking unfeasible. Wildcard countered the general feeling of dread by putting together another homemade breakfast. We're running late on the jobs we'd set aside. Gentlemen, the Horizon Gala is tomorrow night. Dervish, tell me you got an invite for that. Dervish grunted over a slice of fake bacon. Yeah, but only for me. Since I'm the only one Darius knows personally, I can run comms on that. But I think we're in agreement that Alvarez likely won't be there. Bloody small event. Everyone crammed into a single theater. It would be a nightmare for him to try to get the artifact in, especially on such short notice. Still, good to pay attention to. Regardless, what about the MT? Shasta thing Ben spoke up at this one. I think, given the amount of great dragon scrutiny we've been seeing on this, Alvarez would have to be an idiot to try anything in Hesterby's house. At her dinner party. Consider that one mixed. The mage's conclave is the big one. Noted Locke. I've been slacking off on trying to make inroads there. And we know that it's where he'd have the most cover and plausible deniability. The artifact wouldn't even ping to security mages. Let's put you on that today and tomorrow. Agreed wildcard. For now. Though. I have another important job for you. Necessitous I need you. Said wildcard. Brandishing a spatula. To get more instant coffee from the stuffer shack across the street. The one across from the dog park where. That one. Sure. Locke stood and brushed off his jeans. Be back soon. As Locke disappeared down the stairs. Benz noted. Shouldn't we be watching his back dervish wave the dismissive hand. To grab coffee it's under a block away. Wildcard has his bio monitor signal. And he's a combat mage. Locke can handle this and if he runs into trouble we can be out there in actual seconds. Exactly 12 seconds later, an alarm began issuing from wildcards come link. Oh, for fuck's sake. As the team loaded up their combat gear, wildcard kept an eye on the bio monitor. They're tacking him for a ride around the block. What are you thinking hostage trap bend shook his head, in the process shaking his goggles down to eye level. Interrogation. 
Maybe magic. Maybe not. We get to find out. Dervish grunted in acknowledgement as the team stomped downstairs. As it turned out, the team was too late. They found Locke in the dog park, slumped against a tree, unconscious. The snow hadn't begun to set into his clothes yet, suggesting that he'd been dropped off very recently. No one pulled iron, although Dervish kept his hands on the heavy duffel bag containing his automatic shotgun while Bend and Wildcard moved to check on their teammate. A prim looking elf man in tennis shoes caught Dervish's eye as he jogged past. Uh, is that guy okay yeah, said Dervish. He looks like he passed out from exhaustion or something. I think those two guys are his friends. Oh, that's, that's, okay. Dervish stared down the yuppie, who glanced at Locke a few more times and then jogged off. Ain't safe out here. Too exposed. Wildcard nodded in agreement, scratching absently at the data jackpots at the base of his skull. The fly spies above us. Same one as before. The Drake rigger is working for Jinsen. Locke moaned groggily as Ben slapped him across the face a few times. Stop it. Stop it Ben checked Locke's pupils as Locke continued to groan in discomfort, slurring his words. What a doing, Ben checking you for drugs. Your pupils are about the size of pennies right now, so I think we can safely mark that off as yes. Probably tranquilizers but wildcard should still check your biomonitor. Locke blinked disbelievingly, beginning to come back to his senses. But, I was just, I napped. I nodded off for a nice nap because I was tired. Ben snapped his fingers in front of Locke's face, getting him to focus. Did you see or hear anyone? No. Do you remember being dragged into a van and taken around the block? No wildcard and Ben made eye contact. Alter memories, said Ben. The Amazonian magician was just here. He also ordered read thoughts, noted wildcard. Which means, Ben's face contorted with anger and frustration. Shit they know everything cool it, said Dervish, eyeing the slowly gathering crowd dispassionately. We don't know shit. Which means they know whatever they know, plus shit. That's probably not a lot. We need to clear out before these people call the cops, as Wildcard helped lock to his feet. Ben called out, don't worry my friends and I are going to take this man to a hospital 8.15am. Lega Suigo, Titanga the team reconvened in an alleyway to gather their senses. Locke slumped against a dumpster, looking especially humbled. That was some amateur hour shit, he remarked. The rest of the team made subdued noises of affirmation. From now on, noted Ben, we travel in twos. We always operate in pairs. Even if I'm sneaking in to do spy things, I want someone else within 30 seconds. Yep, noted Dervish. Even I'm starting to get uneasy at how many resources Jinsen's moved into the tip, and I don't think we've even run into a triple A yet. We got any more leads actually, we do. Wildcard pulled up on our window with a simple text message. Dexter sent me an encrypted message with a time and a place. Behind a sports bar about 5 minutes from here. I think he's come through, Ben grinned. Well, what are we fucking waiting for there may be hope for this fuber up yet, noon. Behind Nicoli's grill, Lega Suigo, Titanga Ben sat on the roof of the sports bar, communicating with Wildcard, who was sitting in the parking lot, to smart gym suspicious looking individuals. Both had inconspicuously tossed a few cheap microphones around the bar, using Wildcard's powerful nexus to filter the sounds from within and isolate any out of the ordinary behavior. In the alleyway itself, Locke sipped at a cheap beer and leaned against an ancient tag waiting for dervish to finish setting up the team's portable white noise machine the white noise machine played to life and dervish nodded at the nervous businessman across from them dexter spoke up we safe to talk we are now said Locke. you know you being tailed yeah don't know by who i pulled some big big favors and reeled in a shark tell us what you know dexter brought up in our window depicting a small cargo ship scuttled on the coast Aura Chalcom's been big business lately with the mining boom, so I've been running a watch group on any transactions involving it. This ship is a smuggling vessel, runner operated. Tickhost guard nabbed it at about 4 in the morning, found 4 dead smugglers, an empty spot in the hold, and a nexus shot full of holes. Locke nodded. Where's the Aura Chalcom come and whoever this was? They didn't scrap the nexus thoroughly enough, they were probably rushed. I managed to get one of my people in. 
one of the people I can trust, and he sent me some of the data from the hard drive. They were transporting Orichalcum on behalf of Johnson. A hell of a lot of Orichalcum. As Dexter paced in the alleyway, Dervish asked, We going to get a number it's the kind of number you have to estimate based on market value. Dervish squinted. So, we're talking could pay for a major artifact here. Dexter shook his head, distraught. We're talking could pay for two. Lock pent his fingers. Anything else yeah. An anonymous message telling them to hold position at a specific spot in the ocean. Because the seller wouldn't be ready for a few more days. Locke and Dervish glanced at each other. Wildcard noted, over Sidvacal, unless it's a bluff, that means the horizon screening is hosed. Dervish turned to face the back door of the sports bar and responded, making sure not to vocalize where Dexter could hear, just as well. Today Locke and Wildcard can handle the mage's conclave thing, but I want Ben watching my back. Ben glanced instinctively over the side of the roof. Why because I'm going to be watching Dexter from here on out. He just gave us really sensitive info and I don't want Jinsen nabbing it. Fair enough. So we're sure about the horizon thing wildcard brought up in our window in everyone's pans. Indicating an increased police presence at festival events for the next few days to counter risks of terrorism. Ben pieced through the article. And commented. Unless Alvarez also controls the cops. That makes the already unlikely circumstance of a handoff there even unlikelier. It would mean that whoever has the funds, assuming that they're the buyer and didn't just steal it, delaying everything, would need to make sure that everything was legit within the next few hours, plan for the operation, and then execute it before the night is out. I think it's time we called this to an end. Dexter, said Locke, smiling. We've got some business to handle. You too, said Dexter. Although his smile was more transparently anxious. The Drake's closing about 500 feet up, said Wildcard. Updating the team. No sign of the drone. As Dervish and Locke turned away from their contact, Locke hit Dervish with an improved invisibility spell. Double back to the car and get your armor. Then follow Dexter. The spell should keep you clear of Jinson's detection for the time being. Right on. I've got a hotel to scope out. Keep in contact. 3 p.m. The River's Edge Hotel, Portland. Titangark Locke had donned his confused tourist get up for this operation, which meant wearing a pair of horn rimmed glasses, slacks with sneakers, which were filling with snow with every step, and the most tasteful Hawaiian shirt that money could buy. The downside, of course, was that the most tasteful Hawaiian shirt that money could buy was still not, by any stretch of the imagination, tasteful. The hastily bought snow jacket atop all of this left mostly undone, was merely the piece de resistance. He hefted his book bag as he approached the hotel, trudging through the two inch snow along the decorated path that flanked the Willamette. Remember, see if you can get into contact with anyone in authority, plumb what you can find off them, buzzed wildcard, into his ear. If you're feeling especially bossy, you can even pull the fake ass secret service in we trumped up for you. I think I'll play it by ear, responded Locke as he made it into the lobby, and promptly ducked his head, bringing his straw hat up to cover the top of his face perhaps quicker than was entirely inconspicuous. To Jody Pewter, the face rex suite you installed on these glasses just kicked me in the eyes. Hiss lock. I'm counting at least five of the Jinsen guys from that old vid feed, all over the lobby, roger that. I'm going to pull around the block to cover you if you need to vanish. Can you still follow up yeah, said Locke. Slipping into the crowd by the customer service desk and doing his best to make eye contact with his shoelaces. Let me see if I can't find someone on security who doesn't ping as Jensen. That could just mean that they're recent hires or members of another cell, cautioned Wildcard. That's what my good sense of intuition is for. Besides, only one of the goons is wearing a security uniform. The rest are dressed like tourists. As I said, I'm here if you need an extraction. Locke instinctively looked down at his subvicle, and harshly barked, I know what I'm doing, okay you don't look like it to me, sir, said an attractive, raven haired elf woman in a smart business suit, as she approached Locke through the crowd, why don't you come to the security office Locke triggered his tailored pheromones and forced out the dorky smile he could manage, of course, miss just let me finish my call, bye, honey I love you, too, darling, 
said Wildcard, switching input to the back door on Locke's earbuds. You don't look like an ordinary tourist to me, said the authoritative woman, as she led Locke past a series of security cubicles and into an enclosed office with old school blinds. That's very flattering, mom, but I don't get why I'm being singled out, cut the act, she responded, her eyes like ice, as she pulled the blinds shut and closed the door to the office. A white noise machine began whirring automatically. You carry yourself like a soldier, and my wage major sends you as an Aztec combat magician with military wear. And I'll let you fuck me right over this desk right now if that Scottish baritone talking about extraction was your wife. Would you buy that he's my husband without so much as a laugh? The woman pulled a sleek custom beretto on lock. The smart link word to fit for life. Damn, tough crowd. The only thing funny right now is the fact that you're still too stupid to talk. Locke rolled his eyes. Fine. I didn't want to play this card, but check my link. It's in my front pocket. My name is Special Agent Vincent Dar Selva. I'm with the Cass. The woman pursed her thin lips and pulled the cum link from Locke's pocket. Directed by Wildcard, it displayed the appropriate credentials that had allowed them past the border. You're a long way from home, Special Agent Dar Selva, one of the sacrifices I make for my work, dead Pandlock, putting his hands at his sides. So if you're so good at catching spooks, you've no doubt noticed the mercs haunting your hotel. They're a counterintelligence op out of Seattle. Commands got us here because we ran afoul of them on an op gone foul a few years back, and we've kept an eye on them since. The woman adjusted a pristine lock of hair with her left hand and then let her right still clutching the handgun, dropped to her side. No shit. I was wondering who was pulling the strings on those new hires. Locke's expression hardened. How many with a playful smile? The woman lifted her handgun again. Wouldn't you like to know step off for now, soldier? We'll handle it. On whose authority mine? Julia Rothschild. Tid Department of Defense. Locke chuckled, settling into a synth leather armchair in the corner of the office. I suppose that this is the part where you have your way with me, then. Rothschild's laugh was more incensed than anything, but a slight edge of earnest humor betrayed the pheromones working their magic. Are you fucking flirting with me? Locke sank into his seat, doing his best to ignore the tension that armed firearms brought to a room. No, it's just that, as we've previously established, I'm in a committed relationship with a very large Scottish man and if you plan on tying me to a chair and hooking a car battery up to my nuts then we might get jealous. You're a real class act, you know that. Dar Selva Locke shrugged, doing his best to ape Jordan Formic's body language as he luxuriated. Well, I'm no James Bond, but I try. This was going to be the part where I reverse the gun on you and then magnanimously spared your life in return for you letting me run my op during the mages conclave. But instead I thought I'd just ask nicely. Rothschild smirked. That a fact I'm good with my hands. Now you're definitely flirting with me. One of the earliest things you learn in espionage school. More than one way to disarm someone. I guess so, said Rothschild, opening her jacket and sliding the pistol into a concealed sleeve holster. However, I still don't see what's in it for me. As far as I know, these black ops fucks are harmless, and so long as they don't shoot up the visiting wizards I'm golden. Well, there's two things that would be in it for you, said Locke, holding up his fingers to demonstrate. One, I keep you in the loop if they are trying something so you can reroute security forces to more pressing concerns. 2. How's dinner sound Rothschild snorted loudly, but then broke out in a grin as she pointed to the door. Fine, and fine, but in both cases, you're not touching any sensitive information. Get the fuck out, and I'll see you at 8. 5 PM, Westmoreland, Tit and Guy Dervish started as the phone in their renter jackrabbit sounded. Bend continued to watch the repair crew, they had switched up their numbers, Bend noted, while Dervish groggily pressed the call button on the R interface. Guys, said Wildcard, Locke just went crazy, Bend pulled his goggles up and glanced back at the static image of Wildcard's mask hovering in front of the windshield, what, you could tell the difference he nicked himself a date with a tidod official, Bend blinked, what, like he kidnapped him no. Like he and she are having dinner at a fancy restaurant. Dervish grinned a toothy grin and stifled a guffaw. You're shitting me. Nay. Pure dead serious. Chummer. Well fuck. 
said Dervish, rifling through a bag at his side for the last scraps of a fast food chicken sandwich. Let's see what happens. 1 AM, the 28th of January, 2074, Ancient Chapter House, Lake Oswego. Titanga Wildcard was keeping watch when Locke stumbled into the safe house. A few buttons loose of the prim business ensemble he'd worn going in. With a throaty chuckle, Wildcard tossed an R window to Locke, who moved to catch it instinctively. As he wasn't wearing his gloves, the window instead just passed through his head, causing him to blink. The prodigal son, etc. Said Wildcard, you seal the deal a sweaty Makia at session in an elevator, but no sex. Wildcard stared blankly at Locke, his artificial face flat. Locke kneaded his forehead with his knuckles, and sat down on his bedroll. Oh, you mean the info? Yeah. I got info. Good work, Casanova. Start briefing. I'll run everyone through it in the morning, you can run us through it now. Buzz Ben, who was still afield, over Wildcard's tacnet. Dervish is out. But I only need an hour of sleep a night. Remember as a window opened displaying Ben's video call. Ben looked at Dervish, who was curled up in the car seat, cradling his duffel bag of guns as if it were a teddy bear. Wildcard asked, we gonna risk waking him up Ben shook his head. Alright, said Locke, unbuttoning the rest of his shirt, we'll bring him up to speed when he wakes up. First off, Rothschild knows that hotel security is compromised. She's been catching some sketchy access codes, so it's reasonable to assume that they've been using the security network to their own ends. Asked her to give me more, but her lips went tight after that, in other words, said Ben, we're going to be running the River's Edge Hotel security nexus tomorrow, I thought of that, too, said Locke, so I, I, I made sure to get a good glance on the way over to her room, even if it didn't amount to nothing, for fuck's sake. You sleazy Aztec. It was a first date. Interrupted Wildcard. Locke recovered. I mean, I didn't get her comb or anything. But I did get a good look at the security exterior. They've got a special elevator on each floor that goes directly to the security offices. We rode in it on the way up. Was that where sweaty elevator McEwitz happened? I thought you didn't care about that stuff. Continuing. Wildcard nodded a concession. And Locke picked up. The security elevator is tricky. The call button console on the outside of the elevator runs on a different system from the interior systems of the elevator. The call button needs to be given proper clearance, and then from the interior console, a spider has to clear your transit. So people who spoof the clearance get trapped in the elevator. But is there a maintenance panel in the elevator? Yeah, look like. That's good. It means that, since the spider clears it directly, I can backdoor on the connection to get into the security nexus. Only one problem, what I'm going to need someone else to physically stand there at the call button, jamming it open and spoofing an all clear, while I go to work in the elevator, lock hazarded, is that something I can do probably not, chumma, actually, I may have a solution, announced Jordan Formic, as he joined the video call, bend growled, Christ, Formic, were you tapping our comms just making sure that you boys aren't so much as grazing the pointy ear tips of any tier armed forces or government personnel, announced Formic, and thank you for not doing anything stupid like clipping Rothschild, she was going to get fast tracked into the ghosts, although given how easily she got her shapely ass compromised, maybe I should rethink that decision, you said you could help right, right, drawled Formic, first off, the horizon thing was a bust, a bunch of celebrities watching movies, and my boys verified the eyed of everyone who came up awakened, ran the thing tighter than a 10,000 new in a night whore. Everything was legit, aside from some washed up pop tartlet doing blow off a toilet. Ben repeated, you said you could help. Formic I just did one quarter of your job, soldiers. You should be lining up to suck my international super speacock at this point, much less thanking me. Lucky for you I have a way for you to make it up to me, and help yourselves at the same time. I have another decker for you. Just for the one job, Wildcard gave Formix Vidfeed a sideways glance. And the catch it's my kid niece. She's a damn good hacker. Even compromised my comlink once, but she's got it in her head that shadow running's as romantic as it is in the movies. Figure you boys could give her a little runner tourism. 
Lock posited, so this is going to be. What a scared straight thing for Mick laughed. Oh, goodness, no. Any 17 year old that can hack the ghost network has the chops for espionage work. And running's as good a start as any. Just show her the ropes and keep her alive. 11am. The River's Edge Hotel. Portland. Titanga Lisa Formic. A sprightly freckled elf barely out of high school. Practically bounced in place as she walked with Locke to the maintenance entrance of the hotel. Dressed in a coy mini skirt and a vintage fudgy hoodie with a backpack nearly twice as big as her torso. She looked every part the Decker steer type, which wasn't really good for Locke's endgame. But a promise was a promise. Where's Dervish I want to meet Dervish Dervish is out on a thing with wildcard right now. But he and Bend will be switching off when we do the run. Remain professional. Lisa. Divitrix Lock gave Lisa a questioning look. Pouting. She withdrew her head into her hoodie and whined. It's my street name. I got it on form spring. The maintenance door cracked open and a transparent blur emerged. Carrying three maintenance uniforms. Right on time. Bend. Bend decloaked and handed an appropriately sized uniform to both Lock and Divitrix. How did you acquire these? Ben Ben cocked his head proudly. Picked the lock on the maintenance hallway. Geckoed up to the ceiling. Tactically traversed it to the locker room. Waited for no cross traffic. Then grabbed these from the bin. Unjammed the cameras. And made good my escape. Lock snorted. You know you could have just walked in and taken them. Right nobody in hotel maintenance gives a shit. And set a bad example for the tourist never. Divitrix beamed as a call came in from wildcard. Hey Ben, we good for the switch off Ben tapped a finger to his ear and nodded instinctively. Copacetic, why think you can handle Dexter duty on your lonesome? Even though we were doing the split into twos policy I think Jinsen's more concerned with this end right now. Watch yourselves. Over and out, Ben's tax suit reactivated as he pitter patted through the snow, off into the streets. 12pm, the River's Edge Hotel Luxury Suite, Portland. Titanga I'm sorry, Garrett. It's just not working out, said Divitrix. Her voice cold and unfeeling over the phone. No, baby, please, pleaded Dervish, his fingernails scratching anxiously against the comlinks receiver. I'm leaving you. I've found someone better. Someone I deserve. Julie, please, please. The line clicked dead. In the security office. The spider who had been listening to incoming calls chuckled at the orc getting dumped, but then hastily sobered up when the cameras showed the massive guest, wielding Jack Daniels and Kalashnikov vodka akimbo, body slamming clear through the door to his room and stumbling his way down the hallway, smashing the wall lamps and screaming jeweler IRA as he took tearful swigs. No 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 no, the spider had just sounded a security alert when, filled with rage and sorrow. The orc punched clear through the security elevator control panel and got his hand stuck, as 12 elves in security uniforms dog piled onto Dervish, who was at this point throwing a balls out temper tantrum and spilling booze all over everything. The spider called in for maintenance. For fuck's sake, some green skin just up and broke the security elevator. We need maintenance on the fifth floor. Stat, roger that, said Locke. Powering up the focus underneath his maintenance uniform and casting physical mask on himself, as Divitrix continued to reroute the maintenance call and wildcard checked his toolkit. As the three maintenance workers pulled their uniform caps low over their faces and approached the elevator a few minutes later, Dervish's screams had abated, as he was now being detained in a corner office, sobbing openly and promising to pay for the damages. We want this back up by 3, said a gruff elf security guard standing next to the elevator. Yes it, not in wildcard. As Divitrix found the relevant exposed port through the wreckage and hacked the elevator doors. Locke started sweeping up the debris around the hallway. What are you doing? Grunted the security guard as wildcard settled into the elevator and removed the maintenance panel. Running a basic systems diagnostic. Counted wildcard. As he looped the interior cameras. Since these old models tend to go tits up with too much jostling, door repairs actually pretty cut and dry. Just want to avoid any system damage from false positives, the security guard nodded and went back to his post. Divitrix flashed Wildcard a white grin, visible in the guard's periphery, although Wildcard gave her a disapproving glare in return, causing her to look down in embarrassment. 
After about a minute of sifting and dodging the spider, Wildcard found Paydirt. Bingo. His voice sounded over the team's tacknut. Jinsen's mole set up a concealed backdoor to their own systems in the security nexus. Spider hasn't found it yet. Didn't know to be looking for it. I'm going to brute force it. This is so cool can the chatter, said Locke. You think you can manage to do it quiet even if they know we've hacked M. It's eye for a bloody eye at this point. Solid copy. Do what you have to do. A few minutes later, Wildcard jacked out of the elevator maintenance panel. We're good to go. Locke moved to make small talk with the security guard, making the other two team members sub less suspicious. Divitrix asked. So now's when we escape Wildcard gave Divitrix another glare and responded. Not unless you want the bloke with the gun there to catch on. No. Now we repair the elevator. Divitrix frowned. I didn't know running was this much manual labor. Consider this a learning experience. Wrench 6pm. Ancient chapter house. Lagar Suigo. Titangar with Bend and Dervish afield again. Wildcard put together an encrypted conference call and began running everyone through the pilfered data. Our worst fears aren't quite confirmed. Gents. But this all comes close. First off. Jensen knows me. Dervish. And Locke by name and skillset. Ben they've tagged as a mystery accomplice in the ghosts, which speaks volumes to how Ben's been keeping himself sparse to their scrutiny. Interestingly, the organization seems to be on hostile terms with as technology, there's a kill on site order for AZT agents, which would explain why they haven't sold Locke up the river. Locke grimaced as he played with his Makuahootl, clearly distressed by this turn of events. The organization seems to be about 90% outside mercs and 10% in-house specialists, the majority of whom are Amazonian, which might explain the hostility to AZT. They've got about 10 active agents operating in the city right now, include Whistler, but a small army of mercenary sleeper cells lying in wait around the tip, Dervish asked, anything on the target glad you asked, Jensen is definitively not on Alvarez or his buyer's side, and their info nullifies the Aztecs as a possible buyer. Nexing the Aslan Ambassador's Ball as a handoff location. Jensen's goal is to steal the artifact from either side for high command, whoever or whatever that is. Interestingly, they still mark the Ambassador's Ball as a target site, but for a totally different reason. Jensen suspects that the ball is being used as a front to move homegrown soldier program specimens, and they're going to stage a major bombing on the Aztecs. They really have a hate on for the Aztecs. I think we can safely assume that Jensen is in bed with the Amazonian liberation movement at this point. Now, as for Alvarez, they almost caught him earlier this month, but he slipped through. They managed to get his astral signature, though, Ben smiled. And he's path of the wheel, which is a popular to magical tradition, yes. But if we assume our info is good and he's having to impersonate an important person at one of the bull events to sneak the artifact past, that narrows our candidates for impersonation down to four. Kick ass, said Dervish. Let's get a brief. First candidate is a tier armed forces four star general, Peter McKinley. Known path of the wheel combat mage, also a confirmed bachelor. Attending the Ra's drone unveiling, but not the mage's conclave. Has a team of ghosts on him at all times, so an unlikely but possible target for replacement. Ben shook his head. McKinley's a famous hard case. More trouble than it's worth. Still worth a look-see, though. Reposted wildcard. Next up is Larry Coburn, a minor executive in Telestrain Industries. Telestrian handles magical imports during the bull season, so we can flag this as a very likely possibility for Alvarez's smoke screen. The only downside is that his authoritative position over magical goods makes him almost too obvious of a target. Lives in a posh condo uptown. Will be attending the Mages Conclave and the Ra's unveiling. The whole team grunted affirmation. And Wildcard continued. James Lynch is the Horizon Liaison to Titanga. Unmarried, like the other two. Lives in a townhouse with a dedicated staff. Which does mean that there's a smaller window to replace him. Will be attending the Mages Conclave and the Ra's unveiling. More affirmation. The last possibility is Harrison Graham. The Tin Arnog Vice Ambassador. He lives in special housing in the government building, has a lovely wife, and also has a dedicated staff. Will be present at the Ra's unveiling. He sounds really unlikely, noted Locke. 
Yes, agreed Bend, but Alvarez could want us to think that, true, we've got a few more variables, said Wildcard, bringing up some images of various shadow runners. Jensen's tagged Alvarez impersonating a Johnson and since then has been trying to correlate runners to employers. Four teams operating in the tick came up consistent as currently working for Alvarez. First is a German heavy combat assault team, lead by a combat mage known as Quake. Other team members include a Sammy and a Fissard, but mostly a mystery. Classic German shadow runners, organized for the job then fracture, already killed about four of Jensen's guys. Second and third teams are both pretty standard setups running out of Seattle. Sammy, infiltrator, hacker, mage. You know the deal. Last team is, special, lock cocked an eyebrow. Special wildcard cringe, the Los Angeles runners. A shadow running team out of Hollywood that goes by the Nightingales, mage and social infiltrator named Tulip, Technomancer named Echo, Gunbunny adept named Tweak, and Resorgeral named Gillette. How Jinsen dig up that much info they've released two albums and a reality trid shall. Dervish choked. You're shitting me. Ben sighed and interrupted. You've never met Los Angeles runners. I believe it. One final variable, noted wildcard. His voice dark. What's up Jensen's pegged us as working for Lothweir and Schwartzkopf, with certainty. They've also been keeping tabs on Hesterby, although standing orders are to avoid her, so Jensen is operating on dragon level. Seems so, Lock gawked. Black Ops Mathurfikas, let's get back to the job at hand, said Wildcard. Sternly, dervish. Tomorrow you're enrolling as a provisional security guard at the Museum of Science and Industry, can do. 8 a.m. The 29th of January, 2074, Ancient Chapter House, Lake Oswego, Titanga what the hell is all this, asked Dervish, in his tailored business suit, as he approached the police cordon around the museum, was there a break in yes and no, said Wildcard, breaking news this morning, runners were caught trying to plant cameras and other sensors in the storage room where they're keeping Ra's drone, you sound giddy, Wildcard, that's because the runners, who are currently in police custody, match Jensen's specs for one of Alvarez's Seattle teams. They plead guilty to corporate espionage. They are saying that as technology is trying to steal the drone, dervish grin. What dirty fucking liars. Ben popped into the call to caution. This could be a double blind, guys. Wildcard countered, unlikely, with the money that Alvarez supposedly put into these people. Millions for placing cameras they'll be set even when they get out of prison. Where is he getting these funds Dervish suggested? He could have stolen the Aura Chalcom. Otherwise, I don't know. Ace that job interview, champ. I plan to. As Dervish bypassed the cordon and made for the security office, he observed the maintenance workers removing bullets from the walls and refurbishing exhibits. A few faces pinked, recognizing new Jensen operatives identified by Wildcard's stolen data. Jensen's got the same hunch we do. I'm not inconspicuous. They know, and now they know we do too. Couldn't be avoided, commented Wildcard. Just get the job. Jenny Holderman, said the stocky woman sitting at the security desk, as she stood up to shake Dervish's hand. She was not an unattractive woman, a set, but suffice to say she clearly favored practical over aesthetic muscle. Only her inherently slimming elven genetics saved her from resembling a stake with tits and security armor. Security director. You must be MR. Strong arm yeah. That, said Dervish, trying not to roll his eyes as he shook her hand. So, MR. Strong arm. What credentials do you think you will bring to this position? Given the recent break-in and other security concerns look, mom. I'm going to be straight with you. I'm an international mercenary stepping in for quick cash. I've served in Bogota, Neo Tokyo, and across North America. I figured that you could benefit from my talents while I base here to pursue my own agenda. Alderman stared at Dervish, and an awkward silence reigned for about 15 seconds. Your first day on the job is the 7th, strong gum, as Dervish nodded astutely and stood to leave. Alderman smiled conspiratorially at him and added, I'll trust you to use regulation equipment and not bring the armor suit. Dervish's grin nearly split his face in half. Holy hell, commented Wildcard. Was that a fan seems like, said Dervish. 
Hey, Dexter's giving me the urgent signal on my cum link, said Locke. Let's set up another meet, Ben said, tentatively. More info already it seems to have been spilling in a lot lately, responded Dervish. High noon, the Blue Bohemian Restaurant, downtown Portland, Titanga the team, in their best suits, sat in a luxurious real leather booth across from Dexter. They had ascertained a relatively private booth at an extremely fancy French Canadian restaurant, with large windows with ornate blinds facing the street. The interior was richly decorated and dimmed in a very traditional aesthetic, bringing to mind both romantic evenings and major business mergers. Wildcard had been loath to hand his car over to the valet, and so had instead parked half a block down from the entrance. Big news, said Dexter, his fingers quivering over his pouting. Really big, it's obligatory, said Locke. But how big triple AAA Megacorp and Great Dragon big, shit. First, said Dexter, looking up from his food, Horizon just moved billions of new yen through to Lestrian Industries, corresponding with the hit on the Aura Chalcom boat. No intent stated. There's word, whispered word, mind, that Dawkins is involved, wildcard blinked. Dawkins Locke responded, Horizon Special Ops. Spies specializing in public opinion manipulation and mimetic warfare. Also, strictly speaking, an urban legend, not to me, they're not, grumbled Ben, they're absolute hell to run a counter op on. Well, I guess we have our buyer, the team nodded. Wildcard extrapolated, Alvarez fits the bill of the Dawkins group to a T. It sounds like he's jumping ship to Horizon and buying his way into a powerful position in the org with the artifact, likely, but we can't guess at that yet, said Ben. The team all looked expectantly at Dexter, whose face showed the all too familiar pallor of fear. That's, that's not all. A few of my contacts say that the magical signature of a great dragon is somewhere in the tip. One that's not has to be. Someone who showed up unannounced. There was a long pause as everyone deliberated, but Wildcard broke the silence. Oh, oh god. I know who it is. Two, everyone looked to the hacker. Amazonian Black Ops targeting as technology, running espionage on has to be and Lothwood Bend was the next to get it. Holy fuck. No, that can't be what it is. Locke announced. Sullen. Sirug the Destroyer is running Ginson. Great Dragon Count. 4 after yet another long pause as everyone stared into their plates, Dexter announced, I'm going to get some air. No one stopped him. About 15 seconds later, Dervish jumped to his feet so hard that he flipped the table. Shit as the screaming patrons of the restaurant scattered, Dervish pulled his shotgun out of his duffel bag and launched bodily towards the front door of the restaurant. Wildcard was next up. His limbs jerking into spasmodic reflexive motion as his wired reflexes kicked into gear. His nickel plated, tricked out predator launched into his hand from his hidden arm slide as he used his other hand to don his mask. Locke used the tip table as a makeshift magical circle and summoned a flaming serpent, while Bent pulled his thunderbolt, turned to the crowd, and yelled. Everyone stay down as Dervish stumbled out of the restaurant, the valet asked. Sir, which car should I retrieve for you? The valet's face pinged as Jensen. Seeing Dervish's hostile intent, the valet pulled a tactical pistol from his vest, at which point Dervish tore out his trachea. To the screaming of the crowd, the valet gurgled and fell backward into the street, turning the snow red. Target sighted, screamed wildcard as he made a dead sprint in the direction of his car. Across the street a tinny whistling, this time the instrumental to a crime time rap could be heard from a man in full mil spec armor as he ushered Dexter at gunpoint into a gray step van. A mage in combat fatigues decked out in shamanic fetishes grabbed Dexter by the wrist and pulled him in as a dozen pedestrians watched. The pedestrians aren't running, yelled Locke. Why aren't they running as submachine guns met fists and the pedestrians were revealed to be wearing ballistic vests under their clothing. The whistler stopped whistling briefly. His voice sounded over his suit make. Light him up wildcard pitched bodily behind his car and lock and bend dove behind the bar of the restaurant as a clacking cacophony of silenced gunfire burst every window in the restaurant. The restaurant goers who had been too stupid to kiss the floor were the first to go. Men and women in rich yuppie clothes spouted red as they pitched back into the dining plaza. Roaring like an orc possessed, Dervish boosted across the street to attempt to catch the car, taking innumerable small caliber bullets in the process. 
He indiscriminately fired an underbarrel grenade into the Jinsen Tak team, causing them to scatter long enough for Wildcard to pop the trunk of his now bullet riddled Hyundai and retrieve his Havar. The unsilenced gun sounded like a jackhammer as he pumped a solid stream of rounds into their aggressors, ruining the facade of the fancy playhouse across from the restaurant. Three Jinsen operatives hit pavement. Bend yelled, as Whistler slammed on the gas, they're getting away Dervish kept pace with the car, but was suddenly knocked sprawling by a large caliber axe round that slammed through his shoulder. Wildcard isolated the node signal on the restaurant's roof. His accent bled through as he yelled, the fucking Drake land on a roof he's got a bleeding anti-material rifle cover me lock vaulted his cover and plowed through the shattered window to take cover with Wildcard behind the high and eye as Wildcard and Dervish laid down suppressive fire. The pure hail of bullets and debris had put down five Jinsen agents at this point, although the rest had taken cover behind parked cars on the other side of the street. Locke retrieved his LMG, slammed the bipod down on the Hyundai's hood, and began going to town as his fire spirit roared past towards the speeding van. What's it doing? yelled Dervish, as he loosed another grenade with a funk. Accident with a near splitting bang. The entire left rear wheel of the van disconnected, causing the vehicle to slam headlong into a concrete road divider. Give me cover wildcard broke into a low sprint on the team's side of the road, trying to keep his head behind the cars, as Dervish got his footing and boosted across the street into a flanking position. Ben sprinted outside, tossed a flashbang onto the roof of the restaurant to keep the drake occupied, and then dove prone as a renewed torrent of bullets tore apart everything on the street. As Dervish opened up into the undefended crowd of sleeper agents, Locke took the opportunity to switch targets and try to tag the drake, with eight Jinsen casualties spattered all along the sidewalk. The remaining four agents hauled ass for the alleyways as the drake took a few of Locke's bullets, shifted back into a dragon, and blasted into the sky, away from the team, rather than pursue. Dervish extended his sibber blade and worked his way along the line of writhing bodies, systematically finishing each of them off with swift jabs to their heads. When Wildcard caught up to the van, the engine block was on fire, and the whistler was sputtering, reaching for his sidearm. Not taking any chances, Wildcard slammed into the driver's side door, pressed his predator directly against the seam between whistler's helmet and the rest of his mil-spec armor, and squeezed the trigger. And squeezed it, and squeezed it, and squeezed it until Whistler's helmet came loose, revealing that the would-be office monkey was choking to death on his own blood, his eyes wide with shock. Wildcard put two rounds in his temple, to be sure. Wildcard pulled his silent body from the car, before stepping into the driver's seat and looking back into the passenger cabin. The Amazonian mage briefly made eye contact with Wildcard, although his broken arm distracted him long enough for Wildcard to nail him twice in the chest. As he sputtered and gasped, Wildcard reached out and grabbed him by the collar, then pulled him in to put two in his head, as well. Dexter squealed as the gunshots echoed in the confined space, his face covered in blood. There was a lull as Wildcard checked his Predator's magazine. Five shots remaining, thank god, sputtered Dexter, although he looked up to see the barrel of Wildcard's Predator. Sorry, mate. I'm feared that you just became a security liability, as Bend caught up to the van. Wildcard stepped out, absolutely covered in gore. Sirens rang in the distance. Ben. Dexter's dead. Citrup. Jinsen scattered. Dervish is hurt, but not bad. Your car's whole left side is fucked. Does it still have an engine? Yeah. Then we're fucking off as far as we can make it, as the team piled into the super getaway high and die. Dervish grabbed the passenger side door, which was hanging on one hinge, to keep it in place. He groaned in pain as the action put pressure on his shoulder. There was a brief pause as Wildcard didn't start the car, and Ben gave him an accusatory glare. Buckle yeah feckin seat belts. Yeah cunts everyone did. Shadow run story time 20 n. So I've recently moved Nick Badia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Chomp to 
Protective Services. It's time to stop! 